course, I want to thank Eric and Erica for having that lunch with me and assuring me this was not simply a, an illusion that we might have a program such as this at USC and that I would continue to be invited to say something. I did tell them that I couldn't come if they were going to prescribe or proscribe or whatever describe to say what I had to say. And they said, no, say what you need to say. Tell your story. And so uh, I come with my story. I have to admit that Dr. Pastides has been a quiet but steady supporter, as was Dr. Sorensen. And Dr. Sorensen was, was someone who embraced me and my family um, he was on the board of my wife when she was president of Big Brothers Big Sisters, the only local board that he was on. They had a debate about whether she should get a PhD. She got her PhD from USC last spring. And so uh, she's, she's a true game cock. And then my daughter is here, 19 years old, on scholarship. She's here with us today. And uh, she is extremely a uh, game cock. But she also uh, has been a homecoming queen in top 5% uh, of her class. And uh, she, uh, I got to walk her across there with the homecoming thing, vice president of her class, all that kind of stuff. And then also Nick is here, my five-year-old. And I'm going to be talking to him today because I think it's important that I talk to him since I'm 59 years older than he is. And so I may not be around when he's 59. And so I want to... Uh, you all to, to allow me to speak to him as I speak to you also. My belief is, is that if we really are good at what we say we are, then we ought to test ourselves. And so some years ago, I met a young man, a Vietnam veteran. Uh, I had signed up for the Marine Corps, and the Marine Corps scared me so much, they let me out. And uh, I was going to go to Quantico, and they said that uh, black officers were lasting about five minutes. Well, he got to go. And his unit got nine presidential citations, came back, and uh, was suffering with PTSD, uh, alcoholism, and other things. And so uh, I asked him if he wanted to come to South Carolina with us. And two years after we got here, the door had a knock, and, and we called him Uncle Fred. So I adopted me, a man two years older than me. Everybody says you should adopt children, but I adopted him. And during this 10 years, he has not had a drink of alcohol. He's no longer screaming in the night and you can at least approach him and touch him. And he's come uh, and spoken to some of our classes about what it was like to, uh, to, to live in the United States, go fight in a war, people you didn't know come back and couldn't get a job. But he's here with me, we call him Uncle Fred. To my students, thank you for coming. We had a lot of students, but they decide what they wanna do on a, on a day like this. But for those who came, I thank you. And my friends and some of the people I've known over uh, a period of time. My own personal pastor is here. Uh, he's sitting right there next to his wife. He's, she's in the red, and he's, he's my personal pastor. He doesn't know they just got told that today. <laughs> and so to the administration and to all of those who uh, would allow my mother's, and I said plural mother's son, to be here today, I am honored. Fifty years ago, I had a dream. Little did I realize I was unacceptable, substandard, and wretched, with limits everywhere. You see, I believe that experience, coach, is the language of the spirit. My evidence-based spirit was clear about who I was and what I deserved. You see, I was, like Hans Christian Andersen says, an ugly duckling. An ugly duckling is one who finds himself in a situation not of their making and attempts to sound like the duck, walk like the duck, be like the duck, only to find out they're not very good at being a duck. And in the duck yard, they get rejected and made fun of. But what they need to know, they don't know, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute, what we all need to know. Privately, let me talk a little bit about this. My uh, I was born to an unwed mother on her birthday after she had gone out and had a procedure done to eliminate the potential shame and wretchedness she would have if she bore a child like me. 
ironically, again, on her birthday, I was born. I, the, she was given to her, her married sister because that was going to protect the family image. They were a very religious family. They were well uh, positioned in the black community and having uh, this, as they called it, bastard child uh, was too much of an imposition on their image and so they got together and turned me into a sacred secret. I was to never know who my real mother was. The problem that we had was that the sisters had sibling rivalry. One was super beautiful and omnicompetent, and the other one was a little darker, and we had this issue in our family that it was, you know, uh, if you're black, get back. If you're brown, stick around. Uh, if you're yellow, that's melon. If you're white, it's all right. And if you're near white, we'll count it as right. And so the mother who raised me was a lighter skin, and the other, my real mother was a little bit darker. And when I popped out, I was light enough for the family to keep. One of the problems that we had was is that in this keeping of the secret, they took me off to Washington, D.C., and I was born in a kind of an interesting little situation with an intern, and my mother was given a lot of medication, and the idea was real simple. If you give the mother something, the child gets it, and when I was born, I didn't breathe. The physician went out, young intern, and said he didn't make it, and the family member simply said, glory, hallelujah, God knows how much we can bear. And then the nurse comes out and taps him on the shoulder and says, you need to come back in. We've wrapped him up, we've cleaned him up, and we're sending him down to the morgue, yet he lives. And so my great-grandfather, I am told, went in, a little man about five foot two. I'm told he's descended from Andrew Jackson. He was a little boot black, dyed man who was quite successful, president of Paul Quinn College and taught at Howard University. He went in the room, and he looked at me and came out and told the family, touch not God's anointed. And so the family had to come up with a way to keep me, and so they did. The problem was that these two sisters suffered from the same disorder. They suffered from the belief that they were wretched in their hearts. And then they fought with each other. And so as I reminded the mother who raised me of her sister, her alcoholism would set in, and the kind of thing would happen would be I would be one minute dealing with an angel, and the next minute, I started believing in hell. She had fun little things we used to do. One of them was uh, hold you down, tie you down, and beat the devil out of you on a daily basis. She believed that, that, that we were wretched, and she said, you're born in sin and iniquity, and the devil's in you, and I'm going to beat it out of you. What she didn't really go into, because I didn't understand what was going on, because I, of course, thought she was my mother, because she's the one that taught me to sew, to cook, and to play basketball, and to play football, and all of those kinds of things. I didn't understand when she would do this flip-flop, or when she made me pay room and board at the age of 15, or she wouldn't allow the siblings that followed that were her children that uh, wouldn't allow them to talk to me and speak to me. And I would go days and weeks without anyone in my family talking to me. At the same time, I would be uh, breaking into an all-white school to play football and that kind of thing. I'll tell you about it in a minute. And so what basically happened was is that on my mother's, and they're both dead now, deathbed, one of them said, do you remember we always called you an ugly duckling? And I said, yes, you did, Annie. Why did you call me that? She says, because you are my little ugly duckling. It was a secret. But since it was a secret, I had to have a way of saying something to you. I was trying to send you a message. And I said, and that message? She said, the message is, is that, 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 that you're a sacred secret and that there's something you need to know. I just can't tell you yet. She said, but now I'm dying. I'm looking into the eyes of God, but I'm talking to you, and I want you to know that if you could achieve all that you've achieved, Reverend Dr. Books and all that, if you could do all of that believing that you're wretched and that you're unacceptable and that kind of thing, how much more could you do if you were to believe that you were one of God's chosen and that you were loved by God? How much more would you be able to do if you weren't trying to prove that you had a right to be here? And I said, I'm not sure. She said... I'd like you to stop being a man of the crucifixion and become a man of the resurrection. And would you please go out and find the other ugly ducklings who are running around here acting like ducks, walking like ducks, and doing all this kind of duck stuff, and let them know if they could get through the winter of their despair, find out who they really are, they would realize that they're really swans. And they died. Jealousy, envy, greed, and betrayal filled my family. 
That is how I got prepared to go out into the world. You see, finding out how to overcome the odds and go beyond was not a luxury for me, it was a need. Initially, this secret that I didn't even know about was like a cross hanging on me. Can you imagine with me for a moment having a cross hanging on you that you don't even know is hanging there? On two occasions, I was homeless. I found out it was like what it was like to have a degree and be homeless, eat out of garbage cans, live out in the back of somebody's house trying not to get caught. You see, it seemed logical to me and reasonable to me that this homelessness would come my way because I was what my parents, my mother passed on, my mothers passed on to me, and that was wretched. Now, Coach, I'm setting this up because what I want you to know is that then when I got ready to go play sports, we integrated a school. I was the first black they had in the team in 20 years, and we were Lake Erie League champions. But I came from Minnesota where Sandy Stevens was the uh, first Big Ten quarterback who was African-American. Murray Warmoth uh, uh, brought him in along, Bobby Bell and a bunch of others. And because blacks had to live in a particular community, Sandy dated the girl behind me. Judge Dixon was next door. Bobby Bell was down the street. And so Bobby and all of them would, would, would talk with me. So Sandy would teach me how to quarterback, All-American. I threw right-handed and left-handed, more than 60 yards with either hand with accuracy. And the coaches, when I moved from Minnesota, where they said, you're going to be the next Sandy Stevens to Ohio, my high school coach told me, he said, uh, you don't have the brains to be a quarterback. You're too athletic. All this throwing right-handed and left-handed and being able to kick and do all of that's unacceptable. That's not the way you play quarterback. On top of that, you're not bright enough to play quarterback. Little did he know I was in the honors program. But it didn't matter. He said, I can't put a black quarterback out here in front of all these white parents. And so we're going to put you at pulling guard, 157 pounds on a high school team, Lake Erie League champions, that their offensive line averaged over 230 pounds, and the defense was about the same size. We were big people. Put me, 157 pounder, at pulling guard. I refused to do that, but I then said, and one day I was just so upset that I would play middle guard, 157 pounds, and that's where I earned my letter, and that's where I, I, I made first string. And what did I do? At 157 pounds, I jumped between the guard and the center, snatched the ball out of the quarterback's hand, and eventually one of the assistant coaches said, Coach, we got to play him. This man's in the backfield. He's taking the ball from the quarterback. We had a game in which we had lost 42 to nothing the year before. All of us came back. First play of the game was against Euclid. They simply ran right down the field, got six points, ran right over the middle guard who got to start. The ending score was 40 to six. I took the ball from the quarterback at least three times, hurried his passes all through the game. I knew, and then I had something like 20 tackles. I knew that was my day. And the quarterback was named All City. Honorable mention, the whole works, not me. In fact, when I looked on the chart, I didn't have the tackles or the, re the fumble recoveries. They weren't listed. And so I asked Coach, I said, Coach, watch the film. That was me. He said, no, that was Keith. I said, no, that was me. Keith went out when they ran over him the first time. That was me. Evidence. I told my mothers I wanted to be a jet pilot, a medical doctor, the president of the United States, and an NFL quarterback coach. That's what I told them. Publicly, uh, a military recruiter said, the government's not going to trust you with a jet fighter. My undiagnosed dyslexia, the summer I attempted to take organic chemistry, trigonometry, and calculus in five weeks, said you're not smart enough. My mother's reminded me, honey, you cannot drink out of the white water fountain and use the white bathroom. Do you really think folks are going to vote for you to live in the White House? And so I gave that up too. A young girl in high school was beaten so bad uh, that she missed two weeks of school for talking to me in study hall after a friend told her father that she had a capital N for a friend. He told her he preferred that she date one of the three boys who were charged with molesting her and raping her. 
rather than be friendly to an end. I had evidence-based experiences telling me who I was and what I deserved. And so you might ask, um, with all of this kind of stuff going on, and me understanding that I'm an ugly duckling, unacceptable, substandard, wretched, and according to the public world that I encountered, I was all of those things. And you have to also remember, 50 years ago, USC would not allow me to come here. That's another reason why I'm so honored to be here today. Uh, as I was talking with the coaches, I said, you know, sometimes it wasn't that I was waiting, but sometimes you just got to hang around long enough. And so now that I'm on the front page of the Carolinian of the inaugural issue of the No Limits, talking about overcoming the odds, simply my little black self has now transcended something that 50 years ago I couldn't transcend. And oh, by the way, I wouldn't have been allowed to play quarterback here at USC. And so you ask me, what changed all this? What made the difference? This is something our athletes and our students need today. I found out who I really was. You see, an ugly duckling is really a swan. I needed to know, not just believe that I was a swan, and I needed somebody to help me come to that conclusion. The evidence of my experiences said ugly duckling. My dying mothers reminded me they used to call me their ugly duckling, and despite my experiences, I really was a swan. I heard them say it, but I couldn't believe it. Two, then there was the experience, pastor, of mediated love. Key people at key times with key information leading to key experiences of unconditional acceptance of a person's being that was strong enough and long enough to be embraced as real. When you, you see, when, when, when people know you love them, you can talk to them almost any kind of way because they've accepted that you love them. And if you are affirming who they really are, they're affirming who you really are, then they can take criticism a lot better. I was sharing that the passive aggressive way that slaves used to get even with their slave masters when the slave masters humiliated them and, and mistreated them was to simply pick cotton a little slower and to pick a little less of it. And passive aggressive is still big time in our culture today. How do you get even with somebody who's doing that kind of stuff to you? You do it passive aggressively so they can't be sure. Coach, they just forget to play. They just forget to throw the ball the right place. They just forget what hole to run in. They just forget uh, where the basket is sometime. And so you just do that. But guess what? It's not even conscious. It's unconscious. Why? Because when you believe you are wretched, then you can't be national champion. When you believe you're wretched, you can't be all that you can be and all God intended you to be because ultimately to be champion is to say, but I don't deserve it. And so I get to sabotage myself. What kind of things can I do to sabotage myself? I cannot learn to read and write. I can stop going to class unless you make me. I can stop being motivated because, see, I'm not motivated because in the deepest part of my being, I understand that I'm wretched, unacceptable, untouchable, and that I'm ugly. And so you can surround me with beauty, but I don't even deserve to be there. And if I do think that I deserve to be there, I become narcissistically insane. I start thinking that it's all about me. The experience of mediated love. Key people at key times with key information leading to key experiences. And now let me add this, key people who intentionally care show concern and demonstrate compassion, and who are conscious and committed by choice, and it's clear to the person that it's by choice, to be nurturing in terms of a person's God-given or innate potential in them, in them and others and in themselves. That's the key going forward. Son, Nick, I want to read to you something Langston Hughes says. Well, son, I'll tell you, life for me ain't been no crystal stair. It's had tacks in it and splinters and boards torn up and places with no carpet on the floor, bare. But all the time I've been a-climbing on and reaching landings and turning corners and sometimes going in the dark where there ain't been no light, 
So boy, don't you turn back. Don't you sit down on the steps because you find it kind of hard. Don't you fall now, for I, your daddy, is still going on, honey. I'm still climbing. And life for me ain't been no crystal stair. But today, here and now, at this USC, 50 years later, I want to say to my son and my daughter, my wife and my family, friends, and I want to say even to my enemies, We may be ugly ducklings to some, but I need to let you know that we're wretched no more. And how do we know that? Because to God and in our hearts, we now know we are swans. And to my mothers who are dead, I simply say, mothers, I have a new dream. And that new dream is no limits, no limits, no limits, because we are wretched no more. What do we say, son? No, no limits, no limits, no limits. Thank you.